So this happened on Halloween, when I was about 11. My friend and I decided to go trick-or-treating. Yeah, we were a little old, but we just wanted some free candy. I lived in a very nice neighborhood, one of the ones where everybody gives out the full-size candy bars, so it wasn't unusual to have a lot of people come there to trick-or-treat. However, that also meant that there was about an acre of front yard for each house, so it took about three minutes to walk between each door. It was a good night for Halloween, weather-wise. Not too chilly, not rainy, or anything. This is important later. So it's approaching 8.30 p.m., and after hanging out on the golf course and appreciating our candy haul, we decided to start heading home and call it a night. The street I live on is a gigantic U-shape, like a little over half a mile walk from the top of the U, down the bend to the other side. We were walking towards the end of the U, further from my house, as we wanted to take the long way since it was such a nice night. It's about 9 p.m. now, so no one else is really out anymore at this point, and people turned off their porch lights, the universal signal for no more trick-or-treaters. That's when we noticed a lone white van parked on the street. We made a joke about how it looks like one of the stereotypical kidnap vans with the painted windows. That's when we noticed it shift out of park and slowly creep down the street towards us and park at the next house. Oh, they must just have kids trick-or-treating. It wasn't uncommon for people to drive their kids from house to house since they were so spread out in our neighborhood. But given that it was 9 p.m. and a night with nice weather, it struck us as a bit odd. We checked every few minutes and it seemed to just be stopping from house to house, like normal. We turned around again and kept walking at a leisurely pace, gossiping and whatnot. This is when we hear the car squeal as it moves forward down the hill and park again, this time only about two houses away from us on the opposite side of the street. Again, weird time to trick or treat, but whatever. That's when we realized there were no kids getting out of the van. Not once. Now this was before my first phone, a red and white Samsung Propel, since it was 2008. We were only 15 minutes from my house, but a bit disturbed. So we walked to the nearest door, rang the bell, and stuck our bags out, an attempt to act normal. A woman opens the door, just a crack and proceeds to berate us for trying to trick or treat at this hour and slams the door before we could even say a word. Okay, thanks lady. We turn around and the van is right there, parked in the wrong direction on our side of the street. The windows are tinted so we can't even see the guy driving. Trying to keep our cool, we casually walk away from the door and end up on the street into this cul-de-sac loop that's on the side of the street that makes up the bigger U. If you cut through that loop and hop a couple of fences, you can end up at my back door. The van goes the same way. Now we know he's following us, since there's no reason for him to go up this side street otherwise. We break into a sprint, and I'm by no means athletic, but I hop those fences like an Olympian. We run inside my house, lock all the doors, and freak out while we sit in the front hall. Not five minutes later, the van slowly drives down the street past my house. We stress eat our candy and think of what could have happened if we hadn't been aware of our surroundings. Fake trick-or-treater man with a creepy white van. Let's not meet. When I was around 28, I moved out of my parents' house and into my own apartment in the suburbs of California. Life was kind of like what you'd expect for California. It rained a lot and was brutally hot during the summer months. This didn't really bother me as I mostly stayed indoors and never really had a reason to spend time outside until a night where I was going through something dreadfully awful. I had just broken up with my now ex-boyfriend over some problems we'd been having. I won't go into exactly what it was, but let's just say life can be full of disappointments. Feeling down and depressed, I put on my shoes and decide to go outside to take a walk to just keep to myself. So there I am, 
walking down the sidewalk, reflecting on life. When I walk past the local graveyard and just turn to look at it, I really didn't know why, but there was something about it that just felt peaceful. It was creepy, but at the same time, I felt at peace, wondering how life is like after we leave this world. Suddenly, that's when I thought I could see someone trying to hide behind one of the tombstones. At first, I thought it could have been security patrolling the area, and with that, I was about to leave. However, as I took a step back, I came to the realization that it wasn't security at all, but rather some woman who I'd never seen before. She seemed normal, maybe mid-30s, wore casual clothing, but was a bit off as she kept on looking up every few seconds. She spots me and slowly walks over to me and asks what I was doing out here. I tell her that I was just taking a walk, as I had just ended a relationship with my ex. I then ask what she was doing in a cemetery past hours. She looks around for a few seconds and completely ignores my question and starts questioning me about what I was doing. Mind you, the cemetery was surrounded by a large gate, so that meant she had to have purposely gone over. In the end, I just assumed someone close to her had passed and went to visit them. Not wanting to pry and too tired to care, I tell her that I have to head home and to have a nice night. She then stops talking and just watched me as I leave the cemetery and down the street to my apartment. Mid-walk, she then stops me and says something that made my heart drop. I hope Cindy feels better. My blood ran cold as she said this. For context, Cindy is my little sister's name, who still lives with my parents in a different state. She suffers from crab disease, which is a rare metabolic disorder mainly found in children. It's basically when the body builds up various lipids and oil that can destroy brain cells. She's been responding well to possible treatment and therapy. I have no idea how this woman knew my sister, never mind her condition. I walked back to my apartment, not saying a word to anyone. In fact, I just told myself that I'd forget about it soon and to just go on with life. It wasn't until two weeks later, when a colleague and I were talking near that cemetery, when she began to tell me her story about a woman who was always there. It came to a point in her story where I immediately realized that she was talking about the same woman who I had seen. Apparently, her name was Sarah Lopez, and she tried to lure my friend to go into the cemetery with her to help her find her dog. Obviously, my colleague wasn't stupid, as the situation was basically a whole red flag. At one point, we go to the front entrance of the cemetery and inform the security guard working at the front about the woman named Sarah Lopez, who kept on trespassing into the cemetery. The security guard gets this confused look on her face, and after a few seconds, her eyes went wild and says something that still haunts me to this day. Honey, what do you mean? Sarah Lopez died 10 years ago from a car crash. How could you have seen her? That creeped us out for weeks, and we never returned to the cemetery again. Throughout my life, I've never believed in the paranormal, but I still have no explanation for this. So it was a nice October evening. I was still in my senior year of high school, 16 female. I was attending some evening English classes at the time. I'm from a non-English speaking country, but I decided to skip since I was kind of worn out from all the studying. Instead, I went to my favorite half library, half shop establishment in a mall. I actually went there on purpose to buy a Hunter Thompson's book since I was and still am a huge fan of his works. However, once I came there, I noticed they had a concert evening and some small hippie band was singing just near the shelves I needed to go to. This library is a two-story establishment with the second floor being really small and like a balcony. Basically, it was a big square first floor and the second floor was as if the square was cut from the inside. I'm sorry, I can't explain it well, 
But the point is, you could see the whole library from any spot. There weren't any separate rooms. So I get to the second floor and browse the biography and memoir shelves, thinking how I could get to my desired book. No one was even sitting near the band, so I anticipated that I wasn't allowed to go near them. There were a couple more people near me, but I didn't pay attention. Suddenly, a man came up behind me and said, Excuse me, can I look at these books? Being that I wasn't really interested in any of those, and looked through them just to kill some time, I immediately replied something like, Yes, of course, and shifted slightly to the right. When the man was directly near me, I could get a good look at him. The first thing I thought upon checking him out is that he looked very much like Mads Mikkelsen, maybe a slightly uglier version of him. He was well-dressed, looked normal and presentable. I didn't think anything of him, but then he started talking to me. He asked something like, Hey, what are you up to? Why are you here? I was a little shocked, since this man was obviously a lot older than me, and I've always looked my age, maybe even a little younger. But I went along, replying something like, Yeah, I'm here to get this book, but there's a band there, and I don't know if I can get to it. He asked for my name. I was smart enough to give him a fake one. Then, he starts very eagerly talking about the author, Gonzo Journalism, and from his body language, I immediately understood what he was up to. My mother is a psychologist, so she taught me a lot of things about people and whatnot, so I picked up on his intentions very fast. This man was after me. We made small talk. I was obviously uncomfortable, but I didn't know how to get out of the situation. He was talking nonstop, trying to hang on to me. And when, at one point, my phone buzzed, it just caught Wi-Fi. I thought someone was calling me and turned around. He asked me if he was bothering me. Being my little polite self, I said no with a little fake laugh. I should have just brushed him off, really. So then came a really disturbing point when he asked for my age. I cheerily replied that I was 16, which by the way was true, thinking that would scare him away. But no, he didn't care that I was a minor. He just happily replied that he was 46. It got more creepy for me when he offered a chat over coffee. I said something in the lines of, but I'm just 16. I can't really hang around older men. To this, he replied something I remember very well, with a serious expression. You're already 16? That's old enough. You're also just so sexy. That's why I approached you. At this point, I was hysterical on the inside. I mean, I knew that this guy couldn't try anything in a fairly crowded shop, but it was still scary. So, I obediently went to a little dining lobby in the corner of the library, trying to brainstorm any strategies of retreat. Maybe it was a dumb idea, but I decided to say, Oh, I actually have a dance class soon. I'll be late if I don't go now, so I'll get the book and we'll be going. He took it well and waited for me. I went straight for the book. I didn't even care about the band anymore. While I was at the counter paying for it, I really hoped I could slip away, but this man waited just behind me and called for me right when I was about to book it out of the door. He started asking me about my dance classes, what style I was learning, where was my dance studio at, etc. I tried to give the most vague answers I could, so he dropped it and came straight to the point, scheduling a date. He kept rambling about this new bubble tea place, visibly desperate to try to drag me into this. I just replied that it wasn't a good idea, and when he asked, When then? I just threw a never at him and speed walked away. He mumbled and, Oh, okay then. And went the opposite way. Needless to say, it's not that creepy and really anticlimactic but I was pretty shaken that evening. I don't even know why. I've always been catcalled a lot and hit on by older men, but this particular encounter was pretty unnerving, even though I don't think anything of it now. Every time I look at the book, I remember this man. I hope we never meet again. And yeah, one last thing. 
I learned a valuable lesson from this. Fuck politeness. So I'm not even sure exactly when it happened. It's been so long since, but I would put it at a rough estimate of three to four years ago. It was a late and dark autumn night of running in the woods that was lit up by yellow colored lights. The routes were made for recreational hiking routes and runners. This occurred from around 10 p.m. to midnight. A little about myself, I'm a runner. I run very far distances as I'm an ultra runner. I'm thin and fit and often mistaken as a girl. So anyway, the story takes place in the woods in which I used to run often in the darkness. I'm not that type to get scared of anything except my own shadow. Hell, when I see glowing eyes in the woods, I often go out and check them out and often see cool animals such as badgers and raccoons. This trail specifically is well lit for about 30% of the route with a ton of loops around and shortcuts. However, this night was a little bit different as I got a little spooked off when seeing strong lights coming from the direction right behind me. Questionable as hell. I noticed it was a van riding very slowly right behind me. I think to myself, I should yield and go to the side of the road to give the van some room to move past me. The van barely fits to begin with, but something in me told me not to stop and keep running. I was pissed that the van dared to drive in a pathway that didn't allow any vehicle to drive by. So, I stubbornly ran in the center. As time went by, I began thinking that maybe I should just let it move past me and run to where it's not lit up by lights. I was thinking that it must be a service car for the city checking that the lights were working at night. I'm not sure if this is a thing. Nope. It continued right along with me, along with some questionable routes that one wouldn't take. Hell, it wasn't even that far off from me, with about a distance of around 5 meters at the closest, to 10 meters at max. It continued as I went for my second loop, and that is when I knew something was really weird. But this happened so long ago, and nothing more happened than this. It's weird because the person never honked at me or made any aggressive moves towards me. All I can recall is I lost the van by running via the more narrow pathway into the woods. Since I had headlamps on, that was something I could easily do. It was probably nothing, something that can be easily explained away, but it sure as hell was a weird experience. I've had a lot of other weird experiences as well, being a late night runner, but this was one story that I forgot about completely until today. I should also add that the route had some quite steep hills at some of the routes, which surprised me that the van even tried to drive them up. So this happened about a year ago. My fiancé, male 20, and I, female 20, are in college and lived in a student apartment building near campus. We lived on the second floor and the gym was on the first. There was a stairwell near our apartment that we typically used. This stairwell always freaked me out because it wasn't very well lit and it was open underneath the bottom stairs. So it would have been very easy for someone to hide there and there was a door right on the other side that opened out into a dark and not busy road. My fiancé, we'll call him A, and I decided to go work out at around 10 p.m. one Saturday night. The gym was not very busy. I think there was maybe one other guy there, but since it was Saturday night in a college town, there were a lot of people coming in and out of the building for parties. It's also important to note that the gym was an L shape with a full length of windows that showed the hallway. I spent most of my workouts right in front of the glass near the door, while A was over in a different section. This means it was not obvious that we were together unless you saw us walk in together. So, a bit into my workout, I noticed two guys looking at me as they walk right behind me on the other side of the glass and into the stairwell. This is not unusual. So while I took note of it, I was not very concerned. A few minutes later, 
They walk by again, going the other way, with more guys this time. They stare a bit again, and while I'm more on my guard now, I figured that they were just letting their friends in, since you needed a key card to get into any door in the apartment, and now they're going back to their apartment, and that would be it. But no, this continues to happen, where they walk by again and again, with more guys every time, reaching probably eight guys total. After a couple of rounds with them as a group, I start seeing them walk by individually, and most of them are not trying to conceal their staring at all. Even when I look at them, I go tell A what is happening so he can watch for it also. I was a little spooked, but I was not too concerned since I was not alone. I finish my workout, put away the weights I used, and roll up my yoga mat. During this, I'm facing away from the hallway, so I did not see this, but A said he saw one of the guys go into the bathroom that's right between the door to the gym and the stairwell. And the whole time I was putting my stuff away, he kept peeking out and staring at me. I usually will go back up to the apartment when I'm done because A's workouts are longer than mine. But I was not about to go into that creepy stairwell alone after all that. So I go and sit next to A and wait for him to be done. The next time the guy looks out of the bathroom, he sees me with A, who's a pretty large guy at 6'2", and he walks out of the bathroom and leaves. Nothing else happened, and when A is done, we leave and don't see any of the guys again. We think the guy in the bathroom was supposed to be watching for me to leave, so that when I went into the stairwell, some of the other guys would be there and probably take me out to the road and into a vehicle. But when they saw I was with A, they decided it was not worth it. This is obviously speculation. It might not be what was happening but I can't help but think that that was their plan. From then on, I would not walk to or from the gym by myself. We moved out not too long ago, and I feel much safer at our new place. This was about three years ago, on a dark stretch of road near a main intersection in a major Bay Area city. I worked at a big name healthy grocery store from 2014 to 2017. I was lucky to meet and work with amazing coworkers, some of whom had become my best and closest friends. One of my best friends at the time and to this day, Cav, is one of the nicest, most caring people I've ever met. He is incredibly generous, genuine, and warm and welcoming to everyone, sometimes to a fault. At the time of this story, I'm a woman in my early 20s, and Cav is a guy in his late 20s. Cav and I had a weekly ritual of driving around the city after work and talking, sometimes about our problems, sometimes about what was going well, but it was therapeutic and always something to look forward to. This particular night, we invited our buddy Ben to join us. His department always got out 30 to 45 minutes after the rest of the store, so Cav and I decided we would do a short drive around the area to pass the time until Ben was off. Cav was driving that night. We did our drive and are headed back to the store to pick up Ben. In order to get back to the store, we needed to make a U-turn at a four-way intersection. To get to the intersection, we have to go down a dark but short stretch of road. There are no street lights for some reason. The intersection is well lit always busy, and has shopping center plazas on each side. From the dark stretch of road, it's exactly 302 feet, according to Google Maps, to the main, well-lit, and ever-busy intersection. As we're driving down the dark section, Cav suddenly interrupts what I was saying and says, Oh my god, did you see that person waving? He slows down the car as I look back. No, what are you talking about? You didn't see them? There was someone in a black hoodie waving us down. I'm looking back. I have poor eyesight. No, I don't see anyone. There's no one there. As I'm saying this, Cab is pulling into the empty parking lot, parallel to the dark stretch of road. He reaches to the back seat and is moving jackets and other stuff off the seat, obviously making room for this person. No, Cav, I said. 
No one is getting in the car. Do you understand? But, but what if they need? No, there's no one there. And if there were, they could walk up the fucking intersection. He agrees, but insists we continue to circle around and check. I reluctantly agree, but realize I have no choice anyway. We circle back, and sure enough, there is a girl my age in her early 20s, standing alone, wearing all black. She has a hoodie on. She looks disheveled and is sort of crying, maybe? Cav rolls down the passenger window, my window, about halfway, to which I roll it back up another quarter of the way and asks her if she's okay. She seems off, and I immediately have awful vibes from her. Four guys stole my purse, she says, with her hands over her face. I had my wallet. I literally lost everything, and I don't have a phone. The weirdest thing about this is that she wasn't crying. She was stretching her words out and whining, but she wasn't crying. I said, okay, we'll call the police for you. Why don't you walk up to the well-lit plaza at the main intersection, and we'll wait with you for the police. No, she said adamantly. It won't help. I already called the police an hour ago. This is when I started to freak out. She just said that she didn't have a phone. She'd been standing in the dark for an hour. I thought you didn't have a phone, I said. I, I do. It's dead. All of this is happening in rapid fire. And before I can really mentally get into what's going on, Cav tells her to get in the car so we can help her. I say, walk up to the plaza at the intersection and we'll help you. Cav unlocks the doors and says, No, don't worry, we'll drive you there. The girl has her hands in the front pocket of her hoodie and gets into the car. I'm fucking pissed, fuming. The girl is acting super weird. I remember at this point that I have my box cutter on me. I reach down into my backpack and am rummaging through my crap to find it. Cav is talking to her, but everything she says is contradictory. She says that she isn't from this area. She has no idea where she is. Yet, she tells us that she grew up and lives about six blocks away. As we're driving, she says she wants to go to a particular bar that she could really use a drink. I thought you don't have your wallet or ID, I ask. I kept looking for my box cutter, and I'm looking back at her. She has a waxy complexion, and looks into my eyes as if she's looking through me. It gives me the fucking creeps. Cav is incredibly kind to her, idiot, and keeps saying positive things, trying to get to the bottom of what's going on. While this is happening, I find my box cutter, open it all the way, and hold it on my lap. I turn back and keep my eyes on her. She tells us that she has a boyfriend nearby and asks us to take her there. She and Cav continue to talk, and she says she was kicked out of her parents' house. Her hands still remain in her pocket, and mine remains holding the box cutter. Because of this whole ordeal, we've totally forgotten about Ben. Still watching her, I pull my phone out and call him. I'm explaining to Ben what's happening, and in a matter of seconds, she went from asking us for money and alcohol and saying weird shit to just wanting to get out of the car. We did not drop her off at her boyfriend's house, but a few streets away, apparently, in a random neighborhood. We drop her off, and there's a silence for a few seconds in the car. Oh my god, Cab says laughing. She could have robbed us, or killed us. Yeah, fucking idiot. I'm 100% certain that, at the very least, she was planning to rob us. Looking back, there's so much I would have done differently, like calling the cops right away. We were lucky nothing happened, but I'm positive that there was evil in the car that night. Girl, on the side of the road, let's not meet. Again. I grew up in a small Asian country and lived in the suburbs. Our town was pretty safe, so we always walked to school and took buses to other after-school lessons alone. I started taking buses alone since I was eight. 
This happened during the first year of junior high. I had a strict and somewhat crazy teacher that required us to be at school for extra study time by 7 a.m. instead of the regular start time of 7.30. My older sisters went to the same school, but they were often late, so I would walk to school alone basically every morning. I started seeing this old man that would be lingering around a street corner on my way to school. I was taught to be polite to the elders, so I would nod and say good morning. Usually, he would wave and say good morning back. Then, as time went by, he started to make small conversations. I was quite naive back then, so whatever he asked, I answered. Like what year I was in, how I liked or disliked school, friends, etc. I knew enough not to tell him exactly where I lived. One morning, the owner of a nearby breakfast stand called out to me and told me that she noticed the old man stopping me for conversation. Be careful, he's weird, she said. I thanked her and kept going. A few days later, I saw him again. This time, he reached out and grabbed my arm and pulled me closer to him. As skinny and short as he was, he was surprisingly strong. I couldn't shake his hand off. His face was suddenly so close to mine, I could smell his foul breath. Give me a smooch, he said. Oh my god, what the fuck is happening, was all I could scream internally. I used all my strength to pull back and screamed, No, get away from me, and ran off. I heard shouting as I passed the breakfast stand, but didn't stop nor look back. I ran all the way to school. For the rest of the week, I walked a slightly different route, which added five minutes to the walk. By the following week, I felt that it should be okay to take the old route, so I did, so I could sleep five extra minutes. Walking with my guards up, I didn't see him. I said hi to the breakfast stand owner, and she asked me if I was okay. Then she told me that she and her customers saw what had happened and ran him off and told him not to show his face around again. For some background, my grandma and grandfather bought a ranch home in the suburbs after moving from downtown Detroit in 1969. They were the second owners of the house, and it was built in the 1930s. My grandpa passed away in 1981 in the home. My mother has four older siblings, who had all moved out by that time. She stayed living with my grandma until she married my dad in 1986. Nothing weird ever happened that she can recall from her childhood. My grandparents were Greek immigrants. They were devoted to orthodoxy, and there were at least five crosses and icons in every single room of the house. So, it always felt like I was at church when I was there. The first time I recall any odd goings-on was in the early 2000s. My grandma was in her early 80s at the time and told my mother and I one day, don't tell anyone, but at night before I go to bed, there are people in my bedroom that watch me. Immediately, my mom got concerned that this was a sign of dementia or Alzheimer's. Thankfully, it was not. We attributed it to her glaucoma. In hindsight, that makes no sense or that she was in a dreamlike state, but not yet asleep. Didn't hear much about anything odd after that. In 2012, my parents separated, and my three siblings and my mother moved in with my grandma. My sister and I had our own rooms on the first floor, and my mother and brother stayed in the basement. Odd things started to happen. The motion sensor light at the bottom of the basement steps used to go on and off by itself in the middle of the night, according to my brother. The hallway linen closet would be open in the morning, even though it was shut previously. Some banging on my grandma's closet, all a bit weird, but nothing too crazy. One night, I had a few friends over, and we were drinking in the basement when my mom was out, and my brother was at my dad's. All of a sudden, we heard a loud crash from a downstairs closet, and when I opened it, the metal pole, which had three light jackets hanging on it, was split down the middle. It was odd, because there was nothing in the closet itself that would have fallen 
to make that sort of banging sound. I let it go and didn't think much of it. In March of 2015, my grandma sadly passed away at the age of 95. She passed in her bedroom. We knew she was going to go soon. And before we went to bed, my siblings, mom and I, prayed over her. At about 2 a.m., I woke up out of sleep to someone saying, Get up. And when I went into her room, she was gone. Maybe it was a dream, I don't know. But thinking about it freaks me out. After her death, things went haywire. One night, my sister and I were watching television in the living room, and it was probably 10.30 p.m. I went to the kitchen to get something to eat. The light from the TV was bright enough that I could easily find my way to the kitchen. I looked at the back door because I felt odd. That's really the only way I could describe it. The back door had a peephole, and the light in the backyard was automatically set to turn off at 11 p.m. Normally, you could see the light shining through the peephole, but I didn't. As I adjusted my eyes, I saw a large black shadow standing at the landing in front of the back door. I froze and turned my head and closed my eyes. When I opened them again, it was gone. Needless to say, after that, I felt extremely uncomfortable in the home. Prior to this, I had never had any real paranormal experience. I was on the phone with my mom and simultaneously pulling into the driveway of the house. We were finishing up our conversation when I looked at the front door. It was the kind of screen door that had a white bottom and then a window that would begin at the waist of a six-foot adult. What I saw was my mom kneeling in front of the door, so I only saw her eyes and her curly black hair peeking over the bottom of the window. As I was still on the phone with her, I said, Mom, what are you doing? Stand up. And she told me that she wasn't home and would be there in a few minutes. Again, I froze, shut my eyes, and when I opened them, the eyes and curly black hair were gone. I told her I wasn't going into the house until she came home, and she didn't ask why. When she pulled in, I told her what I saw, and she said, Honey, I was hoping none of you would see her. She went on to explain that since Grandma passed, a small girl with black curly hair and a red dress would often appear in her bedroom downstairs. She gave one specific example. She was watching TV on her laptop late at night, looked up, and saw her standing in the middle of the room with a big smile on her face. All my mom said was hello, looked back at the TV, and then she was gone. I guess this was their typical interaction. Things like the cellar door would be open. I would latch it, come back down to retrieve my laundry, and it would be open again. The banging on the closet doors got worse. The microwave door and the oven drawer would be left open. If we called my mom's phone, it would often sound like static, gurgling, if she was in the house. The worst of it happened one night, about two weeks before we were to move out of the house. We sold it roughly five minutes after my grandma died. My siblings, mother and I, were sitting in the dining room, laughing and having a couple of drinks. Without saying a word to each other, we all went silent. The air in the room got heavy, and it felt like the oxygen was sucked out of it. All of a sudden, we heard an ungodly wailing from the basement. The only way I can describe it is a mountain lion yelling. This was accompanied by stomping up and down the stairs. I hide under the table with my ears covered, and my sister sat still. My little brother cried, and my mom, the absolute badass she is, ran down the stairs and screamed, In the name of Jesus Christ, get the fuck out of my house. We were all absolutely fucking terrified, beyond terrified. That night, we all slept in my room together. My mom and brother slept in the living room until we moved out. Nothing too crazy happened after that night in the two remaining weeks we lived there. It's been eight years since, and we occasionally talk about it. My mom's siblings don't believe it, 
because they never had any strange goings on in the time that they lived there. I sometimes wonder if the new residents have had anything happen. They haven't sold the house yet, at least. Since then, my family has not experienced any type of paranormal goings on. But goddamn, I don't want to live in a haunted house again. My dad, being Irish and wanting to live somewhere close to his childhood home, bought a house in a remote part of Northern Ireland in 2007. It's a pretty old farmhouse, 18th century, I think, and back then was completely dilapidated. I'll never forget the first time he showed it to my brother and I. He had spent the long car journey hyping it up, telling us about how incredible the location was, how spacious it was, the amazing interior, and then we arrived at what was essentially a creepy old building site. The creepy vibe not helped by the torrential rain that was still being released by the heavens that day. Still, over the years, post-renovation, I've grown to love spending time there. There's beautiful green rolling hills surrounding the property, there's a sea view, and the beach is a stone's throw away, with nobody around for miles. It's a hermit's paradise. I have always, however, felt unnerved and creeped out by it. During the first holiday I ever spent there, I was around nine years old, I think, we were cleaning the attic and found an old photograph of a young woman, probably from around the Victorian times. My younger brother was absolutely terrified of it. I used to prank him by putting it in his bed before he went to sleep, or by wrapping my knuckles against the bed frame, pretending that Bertha, as we nicknamed her, was coming for him. It was, granted, an unnerving photograph. There was a wild, vacant look in her eyes, and she was ghostly pale in complexion. A local from the neighboring glen, who knew about the history of the house, mentioned that there was a rumor that a young woman had been unalived by her jealous husband in the late 1850s in a house in the lower glen. So could have been our house, but also could have been one of the other houses in the area. That rumor, though, was enough to eventually make us return the picture to the attic, never to be retrieved again, even for pranks. At night, the house went from being creepy to being deeply unsettling. Bangs, footsteps, tapping, knocks sounded at all hours. My dad blamed the plumbing the old pipes, and our imaginations. And that was what we would tell ourselves too, except that it would happen while the pipes were cold and when there was nobody else around. I remember one morning, my dad and I drove to our nearest village to pick up coffee and the newspaper. Half an hour later, we were back to the immense relief of my brother, who was visibly shaking as he let us in. Apparently, the second he was alone and watching TV, he heard the distinct sound of heavy footsteps walking on the floor above him. Every time he paused the TV, it stopped, and when he resumed it, they resumed. He vowed to never be left alone again, and basically stopped coming to the house after that. In more recent years, I've been spending a lot more time at the house, being a lover of solitude and nature. I can't go alone, for reasons stated above, so I go with my partner, who finds it equally spooky. We both hear the unexplained sounds, the tapping and knocking at the windows, the footsteps at night. My partner is somewhat sensitive and has had paranormal encounters before. She said that the minute she stepped foot into the house, she could feel a sinister, dark energy emanating from inside. I got into the habit while we were staying there of going out on long walks in an attempt to prevent cabin fever. Whenever I returned, she would always report something eerie that had occurred when I was out. For example, once she had been hoovering the living room and had felt two hands grab her by the waist, only to spin around and find nothing or nobody there. She felt taps on her shoulder. 
heard my voice calling out her name when I wasn't at home, and heard the sounds of people moving around the house while she was in the shower. Then, recently, things got even scarier. We decided to go visit the house on a Halloween mini break, and the second we arrived, we both felt this hostile energy, as if we were trespassing into somebody else's house. It was worth noting that, shortly after my dad bought the house, all those years ago, he ended up having to work full-time in London, so was unable to permanently live there. There was talk of renting it out, but nothing came of it. So the house just sits there, desolate, empty for most months of the year. But perhaps it does have a full-time resident, after all. Anyway, we decided to try and shake off the feeling of unease and celebrate Halloween. We did the usual thing, got drunk on cheap wine, put scary makeup and costumes on, and watched stupid horror movies all evening. At around 11 p.m., my partner went to go get another bottle of wine from the fridge while I stayed in the living room. I suddenly heard her saying, oh my god, and I immediately stood up and rushed over to her. She turned to me, looking frightened, and said that she'd seen a white, swirling mist outside in the garden against the pitch-black darkness. It had vanished after a few seconds. That night, the noises and footsteps were louder than ever. A few days later, I was at the house by myself. My partner had gone away to see her family, who lived a few hours away, and would be returning later on that evening. I was sitting at the desk working downstairs in the living room, trying to ignore the growing uneasiness I was feeling. Then, I started to hear, same as usual, footsteps sounding upstairs. But this time, it was different. It was louder, as if a flurry of people were trampling around upstairs. I could hear the sound of bedsheets being moved, furniture being moved. It was coming from the upstairs room at the end of the house, where most of the unexplained noise originates from. The way I describe it to those I related it to was that it sounded as if people were making preparations upstairs for a visitor, except I was all alone. I was petrified and immediately phoned my partner, telling her what was happening. It was so loud that she could hear it over FaceTime. So now, for the most recent, and in my mind, most terrifying happening in the house so far. This happened less than a week ago, in the early hours of Monday morning. My partner and I had flown over for a weekend autumn break, and had been due to fly home that morning. However, she suffers badly with endometriosis, and had a flare-up, which meant that we ended up delaying our flight. Anyway, it was about 5.30 a.m., and we were both in bed. She was asleep, exhausted from feeling unwell, but I was wide awake and listening to upbeat music, just praying for tiredness. Suddenly, without warning, I became overcome with this intense, consuming feeling of dread. I went from feeling good to feeling completely freaked out in the space of about 10 seconds. I took my earphones out and turned the music off. From my position, I could see the door and most of the room. Aside from the side of the bed, my partner was sleeping nearest to the door. I was on the other side. The room was dark, but some morning light was starting to filter into the cracks between the blinds, with the shapes of the furniture and the room being visible. I could see the cracks of light underneath the door being reflected onto the wall opposite as we left the lights on. And then I saw something, a shadow, moving back and forth underneath the door. I started to feel even more afraid. And then I heard a very loud footstep just outside the door where the shadow was coming from. And then a heavy creak of floorboards. I was, at this point, completely paralyzed with fear. Then, and I still can't believe this happened, as I type it out now, I saw a dark gray figure glide from the door across the room. It was hooded, almost grim reaper-esque, and I distinctly remember observing its transparency as it floated in front of the big wardrobe and around the bed 
to where I was lying. It was at this point that I went out of my line of vision and being unable to physically move, I didn't turn to see where it went. I summoned up the courage to use my right hand to shake my partner awake. She, after a good few minutes, woke up and turned the light on, becoming concerned when she saw the state I was in. Apparently, I was totally pale, shaking, and unable to speak until she had managed to calm me down. I'm still recovering now. It was the most visceral, horrifying thing I'd ever witnessed. I think what made it so scary was the fact that I got a very sinister energy from whatever this thing was. We are now back home, and I'm not sure if I'll be back to the house for a long time. This started around five years ago, shortly after my youngest turned one. I had always been sensitive, but this had started to frighten me. One night, I was getting ready to put my youngest to bed. He had fallen asleep on the couch. We kept all the bedroom doors closed at the time, as he was walking and had already brained himself on the door multiple times, trying to close it. I had picked him up and asked my middle, three-year-old at the time, to please open the door for me. As I waited for him to come into the hall, I watched as the bedroom door clicked open and swung into the room. I had frozen in shock and only snapped out of it when my middle had asked why I asked him to open a door that was already open. I'd shrugged the question off at the time, telling him I was sorry. I forgot I had already opened it. No door in my house just swings open. It stays exactly where you leave it. When I told my husband, he brushed it off, saying I must have imagined it, or there was a breeze that pushed it open. The next day, I tested it. I wanted to be sure of what I saw. I left it cracked and carried my youngest back to the same area, and the door didn't move. I opened the windows, and the door still didn't move. Over the last five years, I've seen and heard many things happening in my house. As no one else sees or hears it, they brush me off and tell me I'm imagining things. That is, until this last week. I had given up trying to explain what I was seeing and hearing to my family, as they didn't believe me. I had gone to take a shower, and my husband was watching a movie and eating ice cream with the kids. The lights were off because you can't have a movie night in a lit room. When my daughter came back from putting her bowl in the kitchen, she sat down next to her dad. As soon as she pulled her feet onto the couch, the lamp in the corner of the room turned on. My husband, being the skeptical man he is, thought it was my middle child. He asks if he was back behind the couch, and seconds later, he walks into the room from the kitchen. Now, this is a crank lamp. You have to really turn the dial for it to light up. I turned it off before getting into the shower, as I knew they would start the movie without me. When I left the bathroom, my husband looks at me and says, I think you were right about the ghost. He pulled up the security camera footage, and you can clearly see the light turn on. You can hear him ask for my middle child, and see him enter the room a few seconds later. Now I feel smug that I'll no longer be called crazy, but the activity has picked up quite a bit in this last year and has started to make me uneasy, especially since my youngest has started seeing the same figure I see in his bedroom. A bit of a preface here. I was around 10 or 11 years old when this happened old enough to stay home alone, but not old enough to recognize some red flags. I attended camp over the summer, the typical eight to three routine. My house is close to the end of my street, which forms a U, but for some reason, the bus driver would never drop me off at my house. I would always get dropped off at the end of my street, where I would toddle myself along back home. Both of my parents worked late hours, sometimes not getting home until 8 p.m and it would be very expensive to hire a babysitter for four to five hours a day, five days a week. So, starting sixth grade, 
When the bus dropped me off at home, I would be by myself. I'd do the usual middle school routine, play games online, and watch TV. Occasionally, my neighbor's cat would come into my backyard, and I would feed and pet her as a way to get outside. The only computer in the house was in my dad's workroom, which has a window overlooking the deck and a window overlooking the side of the house. We have large bay windows in the living room, dining room, and kitchen of my house. And since we sit on a hill, you can pretty much see the entire backyard from a nice vantage point. So most days, when I got home, i toss off my backpack and go right to that room. You could see me walk from my front door and pop up by the computer from outside. Unfortunately, this would lead to something that I had forgotten about up until now. When I got off the bus, I did, as expected, go into my dad's workroom and play computer games. About 30 minutes into this, I can hear faint meowing coming from the outside window. I pause the game and look outside, thinking maybe my neighbor's cat had wandered over. Nothing. I just sat back down and resumed playing, only to hear the meowing again. It was quiet but noticeable, and so I checked the other window. Nothing again. This routine happened for a good 10 minutes, and eventually I got frustrated and went into the living room to watch TV. Not even two minutes later, meowing from the window I was sitting right beside. Now I was confused and a little creeped out, so I shut the blinds and kept trying to watch TV. The meows continued, but only when they came from the window right behind me did I jump and leave the living room, officially skeeved. I went into my bedroom where the blinds were down, but still cracked for some sunlight. I tried to read a book, only to hear a meow come from outside my bedroom window. This was enough to make me call my dad, concerned that maybe the cat was hurt, but I couldn't see it to be sure. He said he would have the neighbor come check it out and call me back later. Ten minutes go by, and I get a call from my dad, saying he was coming home from work. Nothing urgent in his voice, just that his job had gotten cancelled, and he could come home early. I thought nothing of it, and only when he got home did I realize the cat noises had stopped. Fast forward to the present, and I asked my dad about the strange incident, thinking it was funny that the cat had followed me around. What he told me next made my blood run cold. After I called him, my neighbor did indeed come to check the house. What he found were large footprints leading in a circle all around the house, clustered close to the walls, so that even if I looked outside, I wouldn't see anything. Someone had been stalking me through my house, seeing where I was through the windows, and making cat noises to try and get me to come outside. They must have known I was home alone, since it was easy to see me walk myself down the street and let myself in. My neighbor immediately called my dad and searched the property, but found no one. The police weren't called, since there was nothing but footprints that led off into the woods and got lost, and I never saw anyone. My dad stayed home with me for the rest of the week. It sickens me to know that there are people that would use these tactics to try and lure kids out of their homes, and from there, do whatever they wanted with them. I used to live in a townhouse duplex by myself with my dog and two cats near a train station. There were often commuters who parked outside my place and passed by through the day and night. Occasionally, I had cigarettes or stuff stolen from my front veranda. I even had my next door neighbor's ex-boyfriend come to my door telling me he had a hitman after him and he had a gun, but none of this scared me like the night I was watched. My dog lives indoors, and I would take him out for a last wee before bed. My backyard light was broken and was up too high to change the bulb, so I always took him out the front. That night, it was around 11 p.m., and I took him out the front. It was a hot summer night, and I was mindlessly standing on the footpath when I saw movement across the road from me. Out of nowhere, 
A man had appeared and was walking diagonally across the street, away from me. I thought it was odd because I hadn't seen him come from the other direction. I continued to think about it. Where he came from was from outside of a house that was being renovated. I knew the owners weren't living there and thought maybe he was going to try and steal stuff. So I kept looking down the road to where he had gone. He had turned the corner down the next street. I kept watching and then I suddenly see his head pop around the corner to see if I'm still outside. This gives me the absolute creeps. So I grab my dog and go inside. I turn off all my lights and go upstairs to my bedroom, which is at the front of the townhouse and faces the street. I thought I would keep watch of my neighbor's house and call the police if he came back. I peer through my blinds, which cover sliding doors coming off a small balcony. And like clockwork, I see a dark figure walk down from the corner and down my street. He's moving towards the house across the road. And then I suddenly lose sight of him. A tree outside of my townhouse obscures my view for a moment. And then he is there. He's not just there. He is stopped at the front of my driveway, standing there like fucking Jason Voorhees. I kid you not. His arms were out by his sides and legs apart in an unnatural stance, like he was preparing for something, like he wanted to come kill me. My heart is racing so hard, I can barely hear, and I'm standing there slack-jawed, looking at this would-be assailant, when one of my cats comes to see what's happening. My cat slides his body between the blinds and window, further opening it, and I see this person, this man, looking up towards me. I'm thinking surely he sees me. If he does, this doesn't stop him. He starts walking down my driveway, undeterred and fixated. I lose sight of him under the balcony and awning. By this time, my eyes are watering in fear and tears are streaming down my face. I don't know what to do. I go sit on my bed. I pick up my mobile and dial my dad, who lives a suburb away. He answers. I whisper to him what was happening, and he said he will be there as soon as he can. I lie down in my bed and lie as still as I can, tears rolling down my cheeks. Pure fear, not knowing what this man was doing downstairs, and if he could get in. What if I hadn't locked the doors? And then it dawned on me. Why am I lying here in the dark, crying? Turn a light on. So I did. What seemed like a lifetime but was probably just a couple of minutes later, my dad arrived. He had an umbrella with him. I live in Australia, so no guns, but he could have at least brought a knife. I stayed on the phone with my dad while he searched outside for the man. The man was gone. Maybe me turning on the light scared him off. I called the police, who said I should have called sooner. Of course, I should have. I don't know why I didn't. They came out with the sniffer dog and didn't find him either. I don't know what he wanted, but for a good year after that, I was so scared living there. I'm still a scaredy cat, but reading other stories makes me realize I'm not alone, and we can all learn from these experiences. So we, I, know what to do if something scary happens. It was a summer night, and I was around eight or nine years old. A group of six of us kids were playing manhunt, kind of like hide and seek, in our neighborhood. The street we played on was a dead end, with a baseball field at the end. The field was undergoing construction, so there were big construction vehicles parked, and big mounds of dirt. We were hiding and attempting to cross the field without getting caught by the opposing team. As we made our way across the field, a white truck flashed its light at us. We were startled because we didn't think there was anyone in the truck, and one of my friends started to run. I froze up and noticed two old men in the truck. The driver laughed as he rolled down his window and said, It's too late for little girls to be out alone. He creeped me the fuck out. He had a thick mustache, wore big, thick glasses, and a baseball cap. We booked it out of there. 
and I don't remember much else from that night other than the fact that one of my friends was so scared she literally pissed herself. Later on that week, one of my friends from that night and I were on one of our afternoon walks around town. As we walked by the town hall, something pulled me to take a closer look at one of the notices taped onto the window. It was a sex offender listing for the creepy driver of the white truck. Even at that young of an age, my friend and I were very aware of how dire a situation we could have been in that night. My first experience with the paranormal was actually a string of experiences. I was 16 and my family had just moved into a new home. I loved the house. I had my own room that I picked myself and I didn't feel any kind of hesitance while unpacking and decorating to make myself feel more at home. Everything was great, at least for the first week. After school, I would get home with my little brother about an hour before my mom. One day, I was the first one into the home. I threw my bag on the kitchen table and found my cat, stood frozen, staring at the door in the kitchen that led to our garage. I spoke to my cat. What are you doing? I walked towards him, but before I could touch him, a woman's scream came from the garage and my cat sprinted from the room. I followed, taking my little brother with me outside and calling my mom. My brother insisted, he didn't hear anything, and my mom suggested that I must have imagined it, but I knew it was real. Once my mom got home, we checked the house to find nothing. She suggested that I was stressed and watching too many scary movies. I didn't bother to argue any further. I could tell that I wasn't going to be believed, so I grabbed my bag and walked to my bedroom at the end of the hall. I stood in the doorway, freezing in my tracks. My closet door was slid open and hanging from its track as if someone had tried to pull it off. And my pillow was standing in the middle of the room, a flat, flimsy pillow that I couldn't get to stand if I wanted it to. I yelled for my mom. Someone's been in my room. She came back, my little brother trailing behind her. I pointed in the room, only to find the pillow now laying flat as it should have been the whole time. You must have knocked it off the bed when you woke up this morning. She brushed it off, but I knew I hadn't. And even if I had, how was it standing like that? I played with the pillow for several minutes, trying to mimic the position it had been in, but I couldn't. It wasn't possible. I went to bed that night without a problem. While I did think what had happened earlier that day was strange, I didn't lose sleep over it, but I was prone to walking throughout the night. So like clockwork, I woke around 3 in the morning and got up to go to the bathroom. When I returned to the doorway of my bedroom, I froze. I could see a figure sitting on the edge of my bed. It had no features, just the shadow of a large man. I leaned forward, squinting my eyes, trying to adjust my vision to the darkness of my room. But before I could move any further, the figure stood and charged at me. I have never screamed so loud. My feet came out from under me and I hit the floor, my hand flipping on the light before I had lost my balance. Nothing was there. My mom and brother were there in an instant, wondering why I was screaming and now crying on the floor. I tried to explain. You were dreaming, my mom told me. I was awake, I was up, I tried to argue, but she shook her head. You must have been dreaming. She insisted, go back to bed. I didn't sleep well that night. The next day went fine, that is, until I was back home from school. The house suddenly didn't feel like home to me, and my room did not feel like mine. I felt like I was invading someone else's space, and I was apologetic. I attempted to make a Ouija board out of cardboard and a clear bottle cap. I was desperate to confirm my own experiences. Hello? I said quietly, waiting for a response. Nothing. I'm sorry if we moved into your home. I'll be a good roommate. I'm very clean. I began to ramble, but the bottle cap never moved. I started to feel silly, looking down at the makeshift board. So I pushed it away and climbed into bed. That night, 
I heard something rattling around. I initially thought it was a large house moth knocking itself into something. I flipped on my bedside lamp and noticed the board on the floor. Only the bottle cap was standing on its side, spinning like a quarter in circles. I let out a breath of air in disbelief, and the cap dropped, once again motionless. I jumped out of bed and grabbed the board, tearing it in half and shoving it in the trash. I kept my lamp on for about an hour before I started to feel tired again. Reluctantly, I flipped the lamp back off and drifted to sleep. I slept with a blindfold on, irritated by the smallest bit of light, so when I woke up again, Feeling the cold air of my fan, I assumed I had kicked my blanket off in my sleep. I felt around the bed, trying to find it to cover myself again, but no luck. So I lifted my blindfold and was horrified to see my blanket standing tall above me. I moved quickly, attempting to throw my feet to the side and run to the door. But the blanket fell, and I was forced back to my mattress. A weight suffocated me as if someone had just laid on top of me. I gasped for breath, trying to scream, but not a sound would escape my throat. I remember my eyelids fluttering as I lost consciousness from the lack of air. That morning, I awoke with my blindfold lifted, my blanket tossed to the side of my bed, and pain taking over my body. I knew I hadn't imagined it. I came out of my room, and I couldn't stop myself from crying when I found my mom getting ready for work in the bathroom. I tried to explain, but she didn't believe me. She never believed me. You are dreaming, she said to me. You can stay home from school today. Try and get some rest. I reluctantly nodded and went back to bed, still scared to really go back to sleep. I laid stiff and waited for the sound of my mom and brother leaving for the day. I heard the keys jingle and the door close. I was alone in the home. I rolled onto my stomach and cried into my pillow. I'm sorry about your mom, a voice said clearly beside me. I gasped and sat up straight. No one. I couldn't handle being alone there. I got out of bed and walked myself to school. We moved out of the house shortly after due to my mom getting married and all activity stopped. Much to my relief. I used to work as a bio burden tech at a laboratory. It's a fancy title for someone who basically washes the germs off medical devices and sees how much nastiness grows off of them. I got to work late that day and had a large study that needed a stupid amount of work to complete. Usually, we're out of the lab around 10 p.m., but I asked if I could stay until the job was done. Towards the end of my coworkers' shifts, I go into the back where we fill out paperwork, and I just start doing my thing. I got the earbuds plugged in, and I'm just chugging along. I finally finish the paperwork, and I'm heading back towards the main lab area. Keep in mind, this place has no windows at all, so there's no outside light getting in. I swear, I hear footsteps as I'm approaching the doorway to the main lab area, so I say out loud, Staying late too, huh? I set my equipment down for the last study and look around the lab. No one, not a soul in sight. I think to myself, hmm, that's a little spooky, but I don't think much of it. I have the habit of assuming something very logical has happened before I try to convince myself it was anything in the paranormal realm. Now, when you're working in a hub, your arms and hands are pretty much stuck with your back to the rest of the room. Every time I looked at my work and had my back to the room, I could hear footsteps, loud footsteps. The first few times, I assumed it was someone in the back room or something, but I started walking around the lab afterwards to check, but I couldn't find anyone in the offices or other labs. I couldn't leave. What was I supposed to tell my boss? Sorry, I think there's a ghost in the lab with me and I'm freaking the fuck out now. I barely could stand to be in the lab working though, so I called my best friend on the phone and made him talk to me while I worked so I didn't freak out too much. 
Later that week, I talked to my coworkers about what happened and learned that they had experiences similar to mine and failed to enlighten me to the small fact that our lab was haunted. Would have been good to know before volunteering to work until midnight. So when I was little, my stepdad used to work the night shift at a gas station on the outskirts of Reno, Nevada, in a nice part of town off the highway before you head up to the Sierra Nevadas and Lake Tahoe. The area back then was fairly new and the Shell gas station was really nice. My stepdad never had any problems working the night shift, though he did tell me some interesting characters would come in and he often had regulars that he became friends with. My stepdad was the only one in the shop when he worked the night shift, and he was always told about the ghost that liked to pester the other workers, like turn off lights, open or close the bathroom door, knock snacks off the shelf, the works. My stepdad, being the massive skeptic as he is, didn't believe any of these stories, and because nothing ever happened to him, he just brushed them off. Until one night. My stepdad is working on one of the night shifts, and it's a pretty quiet night. He hasn't had many customers coming through, other than for gas, and since it's a pay-at-the-pump station, hardly anyone comes into the store. So my stepdad is playing on his phone and frequently glances up at the doors or at the security monitor to see if anyone is coming, but the station is deserted. He turns his attention back to his game when he hears the electronic sliding doors open and the sound of the bell above the door goes off. My stepdad puts his phone down and looks up to greet the customer, but he doesn't see anyone. He calls out, but no one answers. He glances at the security camera, but doesn't see anyone else in the shop except him, and there are no cars at the station or in the parking lot. He gets a little weirded out, since the doors have sensors, and the only time they open is if they sense someone approaching them, but he just chalks it up to a prank or some sort of malfunction and gets back to his game. Hello? He hears the voice, clear as day, right in front of him, and his head immediately snaps up to speak to the customer he clearly did not see before. There's no one there. He's even more weirded out, but convinces himself. He was either imagining things, or that the sound somehow came from his phone or the radio. And then, he hears the screams. He said the sound of a woman screaming came out of nowhere, and they were so loud and so chilling, he jumped and dropped his phone. My stepdad is a pretty big guy, about 6'2 and a little hefty, and he doesn't normally get scared over anything. But he said that the screaming terrified him so much he couldn't really think straight. He ran out from behind the counter and checked the aisles, but no one was there. He checked the bathrooms and the maintenance closet and no one was in there. But the screams were still going and they were still deafeningly loud. So he thinks maybe there's a woman outside who might be hurt or being attacked. He runs outside to where he thinks the screaming woman is and there's no one there. The lot is empty. There are no people, no cars, nothing. He checks around the back of the store and does a loop, but he can't find the source of the screaming. And just as suddenly as the screaming had started, it stopped. He goes back inside and checks the security tapes to see if he's missing anything. But other than him running inside and outside of the store like an idiot, he doesn't see anything else and he's unaware of what to think. The next day, as he's leaving work, he tells them about what happened, brushing it off as just some weird prank some little shit pulled. But the coworker's response was very different, and even though my stepdad doesn't believe in any sort of paranormal activity, the words stuck with him. Oh, so you've heard of her, too. In my town, we have a library that's almost as old as the town itself. When I was about 12, I was assigned a history paper in school. 
Since we got to pick the topic, I decided that I wanted to do it on the history of the town itself. I went to the library to get some research material. The library is actually a large two-story house, previously owned by one of the town's original prominent families. The second floor was off limits unless you received permission from the staff to go up there because they store most of their historical documents and books up there. I was given permission to go upstairs to look through those books. I had no preconceived notions about the library, but I felt really creeped out upstairs alone for some reason. I was going through the books, trying to find something interesting, when from one side of the room, I heard a loud bang, like a door being slammed, which was odd, since they had removed all the doors. I felt really uneasy about being upstairs now, but I was there for a reason, so I decided to see what it was. Maybe a bookcase shelf gave out. I take a look in the side room, and there's only an old school writing desk with a little plaque that says, Mr. Putnam, 1885. The room is a bit cold, but nothing is out of place. A little confused, I shrugged it off and go back to the center room to keep digging through books. I finally find a book that covers what I'm looking for and sit down to start reading. I get a few pages into the book and nearly have a heart attack when I hear another loud bang from another of the side rooms. This time, it sounded like someone threw a brick at the wall. I can see into part of the room and it looks like it was a nursery or playroom based on the tiny rocking chair and teddy bear next to it. For some reason, I was terrified of going into that room. I did anyways though, because I'm a dumbass. I walked into the room and turned to look in the corner I wasn't able to see from outside. I am frozen in utter terror as I meet the eyes of a young woman in a white dress hanging from the ceiling by her neck. She seemed to see me but was motionless. I tried to yell but I just couldn't get it out. I was, however, able to break free of her horrific gaze and run downstairs and out of the library. I sprinted the six blocks home. It wasn't until I told people about it that I found out one of the maids that worked in the house had become pregnant out of wedlock and unalived herself in that room. I still hate going near that library. When I was around 12, 2008, 2009, My family, mother and father, and I went to visit some relatives, my uncle, aunt, and cousin, in rural Tennessee. We were all sat in the living room, just talking, while the television played in the background. At some point, I went to use their restroom. The restroom is situated to the left in a hallway past their kitchen. There are no doors directly adjacent to the restroom door. I had a tendency in my youth to open the bathroom door before washing my hands, as to not recontaminate my hands with germs when I exited the restroom. So I used the restroom, opened the door, and as I was washing my hands, I saw someone walking by the door in the corner of my eye. I feel it's important to note, the figure was moving in the opposite direction of the living room. The only rooms in the direction the figure was heading are the two bedrooms of the house. Other than those rooms, the hallway is a dead end. I also feel it's important to note that I did not only see the figure in my peripheral vision. It was very slow moving, and the moment it caught my eye, I turned my head. With both eyes looking directly at the doorway, I saw the figure move past the center of the doorframe until it was out of sight to the left. This figure never once acknowledged my presence, stopped walking, or made any noise. The best description I can give of the figure is that it was an elderly woman, hunched over. Not hunched over far, but in the way many elderly people walk without being able to straighten their backs. The figure was wearing a seafoam green nightgown that wasn't very saturated, a very light seafoam green with an almost lacy mesh kind of transparency to it near the bottom of the dress, enough so that I remember taking note of being able to see the legs moving. 
the figure wore very thick and rounded square glasses with a transparent brown frame. She had tight, curly, permed likely, graying brown hair that was holding on to the last of its color. She was also a bit overweight. I saw her vividly. There was no transparency to her, nor was anything off about her. When I walked back into the living room, I asked the family who was there. All of the previously listed family members were still seated on their respective couches and chairs when I walked back into the living room. At this point, I was under the impression that an elderly relative of my relatives had arrived while I was in the restroom. They all reassured me that we were the only ones in the house and no one had come to visit after my parents and I. I doubled down, telling them I just saw someone walk past the restroom door. I even described, probably crudely, the woman I saw. My uncle immediately got up and began searching the house. He started in the back bedrooms and made his way back to the living room, thoroughly searching every nook and cranny along the way. There was no one else in the house. I kinda dropped it. It was weird, but it wasn't scary. I never once felt frightened. We moved on with the day, and that night, I was to sleep in my cousin's room with him. I had never been in that room prior to this night. Once I walked in, I immediately noticed a picture hung on the wall. It was the woman I saw. She had the same hairstyle and the same glasses. She was the same size and had all the same features. I questioned him about this and he told me that was his grandmother, which I knew they had gotten this house from, but it never clicked in my head. She had died in the living room of old age. He told me his room was her old room, and when his parents remodeled it for him, they left that picture up. At this point, I did get a little hesitant, because he had a deer head mounted on the wall. I was a big fan of Evil Dead too. And I knew if ghostly shenanigans were afoot, that thing was going to maniacally laugh at some point in the night. It didn't though. I slept soundly through the night and never saw or heard anything else. I have been to the house countless times and I've never seen or heard anything else. I've never seen another apparition anywhere that I know of. So that's my rather unexplained event. I've told people I know countless times, but I've never written it out in a way like this before. If anyone else has thoughts or even similar experiences, I'd love to hear them. A long one, but a spooky one that just happened to us this summer. Me and my boyfriend stayed at a pub hotel in the early summer back when we were long distance and boyfriend was still living in a different region. He would regularly come up to see me and we'd stay in different hotels in my area of England because I lived with my family. In this pub, in the room we were staying in, we had been having a little bit of an argument, but before it could escalate, I decided to go outside and sit in my car for five minutes. So I left the hotel and sat in my car, which was in the car park, a little after 9 p.m. When I returned to the room about five minutes later, my boyfriend told me that we were in trouble with the manager for being noisy. He told me that after I left the room, the manager had knocked on our room door and told him off for making noise, saying that he had received two complaints about the noise. Before we checked out the next morning, I was looking out of our room window and saw a young couple also leaving and wondered if it had been them that we'd annoyed and who had complained. We went out for breakfast and things about the complaints didn't add up to me. For one thing, we weren't that loud and hadn't been arguing for even that long before I went out to my car. So how had two people managed to complain and for that complaint to go straight to the manager? all in the space of the five minutes it took me to walk to my car and back. I concluded to my boyfriend that the manager must have heard us himself and made up that two different guests had complained. Fast forward to the afternoon of the day we checked out and we unexpectedly needed to book another night at this pub hotel. 
due to the trains, all being on strike, when boyfriend was due to travel back home. While I was at work, my boyfriend went back to the pub and checked us in for another night. He apologized for us being noisy the night before to the woman who was checking him in again. The woman said she hadn't known about us having made a noise, and my boyfriend told her that the manager had knocked on our door last night and told him off. The woman member of staff said that it was odd because the only staff they have on at night was the chef and the young male bartender, and neither of them go upstairs, and that their manager was a woman with blonde hair, not a man. The female member of staff said she doesn't know who the man was, none of the staff do, but that other guests have also told her the same, that a man had knocked on their door complaining about the noise, implying to be the manager. Well, the man my boyfriend had spoken to was in his 60s, with gelled back salt and pepper hair, and he was really mean. My boyfriend recalled to me later that when he apologized, this man just glared at him and didn't make a move to leave, so my boyfriend just awkwardly shut the door on him. My boyfriend asked who else had stayed there, but was told that us and the other young couple I saw leaving were the only guests that previous night. This left us questioning who on earth the man was who knocked on our door, pretending to be the manager. So, that night, we were feeling quite creeped out. We were in a different room that was just opposite the one we'd previously stayed in. Anyway, eventually, we forgot about it, and were having a bit of a laugh, when a really hard knock on our room door rang out. My heart sank, and I was telling my boyfriend not to answer, because it's the man again. He, of course, answered anyway. The door was about two to three feet from the bed we were on. He opened the door, and there wasn't anybody there, or in the corridor, which we were at the very end of. It was a long, straight, creaky corridor. Well, we were terrified by now. The next day, my boyfriend emailed the pub, explaining the situation and saying that we were concerned a weird stranger was knocking on doors in their hotel. We gave them the exact times of both incidents and asked them to check their CCTV cameras, one of which was right next to both of the rooms we'd stayed in. The manageress replied to his email with this, Dear Mr. Blank, Following your recent complaint about another guest knocking at your door late at night, we reviewed our CCTV footage from June 8th, 23, and June 9th, 23. At the stated times, these incidents took place. On the 8th of June, 2023, at exactly 21.05 p.m., CCTV footage showed a man knocking and having a brief conversation with the guest in the room, after which the man turned left and walked down the corridor. However, he was not picked up on any CCTV footage, leaving the premises or walking further down the corridor. Following this, we have gone over security points of the building and made sure all entrances are secured to prevent anything like this from happening again. On June 9th, 2023, however, we did not pick up anything unusual happening on our cameras at the stated time of the incident. We hope these incidents didn't affect your stay at Redacted Pub, and we apologize profusely for any stress this may have caused. Just know we have taken all measures to resolve this. Kind regards, Manager. This email to us made us feel validated that we didn't imagine our experiences, especially to have it confirmed by the manager herself via CCTV. We did ask to see the CCTV ourselves, but our further emails were ignored, unfortunately. This pub was taken over by a pub chain company, and they are very strict with their staff about being anti-ghost stories and only focusing on quality customer service, according to a former member of staff who I by chance managed to speak to. This member of staff told me some crazy things about the pub, Thank you for reading this far. Hey friends, I just wanted to end this video by thanking you for your continued support. You all mean so much to me, 
and I hope that you're doing well. Please comment and like if you enjoyed. Take good care and sweet dreams.